What is up guys? Wrestling Premiere is here. Apologies for the late upload. It was supposed to be posted yesterday, but the problem was I felt like I should have done more with it. I was actually initially gonna go with Kenny D and the other Taker, and I finished that part of the video, but I felt like MVP and Kane were so involved that we just gotta add them to the video and make it the Kennedy and MVP versus Brothers of Destruction video instead. So that's what I did, hence the delay. With that said, we're back to 2006. This was when Mr. Kennedy was Mr. Ah, rising Star. They strapped a rocket on him due to his mic skills, talent, charisma. The little nuances made him stand out for me. He was a brash, unique talent. Sure, he wasn't the best in the ring, but this was back when it wasn't a huge priority to be an in-ring performer. MVP, on the other hand, was, again, brash egotistical, very confident in storyline. It's a very great prospect to look back on at the time. I mean, you can't go wrong with MVP. He had the mic skills, the wrestling skills were there. You know, he had some entertaining matches with Matt Hardy and Chris Benoit. And again, he's one of those guys that should have been champion. Had he been world champion, I think he would have had a good run. Say in 2007, 2008, I think that would have been the excellent time to put the title on him. But unfortunately, it wasn't meant to be. Now, in regards to this feud or these feuds, I, I remember watching SmackDown as a kid and just being entertained by these guys. Like, even though the matches weren't outstanding or anything like that, I still have fond memories of this whole program. This feud was supposed to be looked back on as a very important chapter in Kennedy's ascent to the top of WWE. Granted, he never made it there due to a misdiagnosed injury, but who says we can't look back on it? Okay, before this video starts, I just want to mention the fact that Ring of Honor content will be coming ASAP as soon as possible. I got the Honor Club. I watched a bunch of their matches. I want to do something on the Summer of Punk and Brian Danielson's Ring of Honor title reign. I think that is probably going to be the first video because of the fact that it's so damn good. So yeah, that's just a little update there. Let's get into it. Okay, 2006. Mr. Kennedy at this point in time was probably the second biggest rising star in SmackDown behind Bobby Lashley. Things are working very, and I mean very well for one Mr. Kennedy. On the September 8th, 2006 episode of SmackDown, the United States Champion demanded competition. This was despite the fact that he beat a man that, as he claims, was a six-time NCAA champion, ten-time Georgia powerlifting champion. Those credentials, they exist in a world where Ted DiBiase and Kurt Henning won the WWF Championship. Basically, they're non-existent, and the guy looked like he was straight out of SVR 2008, but that's not the point. Kennedy does decimated the opposition from the D-League of Pro Wrestling, and after the match, he called for the esteemed general manager, Teddy Long, to come out. He does just that, and the reason why the U.S. champion wanted him out here was because he's got an announcement. What's that? Well, Candy's being the best of the best on SmackDown, and because of this, he figured that it's time to take his talents down to Raw. Theodore Long, of course, had an opponent for Kennedy in mind. I think you guys know who it is. It was gonna be, at no mercy, Mr. Kennedy versus the Undertaker. JBL and Cole go crazy, and that's the dance you do after ruining a heel's day. But with that said, Kennedy had barely scraped the surface, yet he's out here saying there's nothing on SmackDown. It's like if you ate at a couple pizza shops, and you're like, I accomplished everything there is to do in the pizza world or something like that. Two weeks later on the September 29th episode of SmackDown, the Green Bay native decided to finally break his silence regarding The Undertaker. He wanted to honor the Phenom with a tribute after watching what he's capable of firsthand. Kennedy gave massive praise to the dead man signing his list of victories against the likes of Stone Cold, Kane, The Rock, all those guys. And basically, what, he, what Kennedy was trying to say is that he's accomplished everything and there's nothing to prove. Like, if you're gonna go in the ring facing me, there's nothing to prove. Nada. Kennedy was very confident in his chances at no mercy, but thought it'd be wrong for himself to intrude on and ruin The Undertaker's legacy. Hell, this guy was so confident in himself saying, oh, I shouldn't even end the streak at WrestleMania. It shouldn't be me, and in essence, Mr. Kennedy didn't want to face The Undertaker as clear as day. Michael Cole was confused, but before much more can be said, the phenom appeared. Kennedy was damn near pissing himself at the sight of The Undertaker, and he grabs the mic. He informs Mr. Kennedy of something important, that being, he will rest in peace. Simple as that. As The Undertaker turns his back, Kennedy, though, thought, why not, and made an attempt. An attempt that went about as well as his main event push in WWE. He's just at a loss of words and just bolted the hell out of there thinking to himself, what have I got myself into? Ahead of No Mercy, Mr. Kennedy addressed the under faker for one final time. The reason why I called him that is because he thought it was a bunch of hocus pocus, just some mind games. And all of that stuff intimidated him and all the tricks meant nothing because he wasn't scared. It was one of those baby faces old, the heel is the new trendy young guy or whatever. It's it simple. But Kennedy did a pretty good job here. Meanwhile, another outspoken wrestler on the SmackDown roster was trying to make a name for himself. After several weeks of Teddy Long pursuing this star, Montel Vontavious Porter finally signed with SmackDown. His character was a spoiled, overrated wrestler. Add to that, he was in kayfabe the highest paid wrestler in SmackDown history. The man had a little too much stock in himself. 
to the point where the commentary team had doubts over his actual abilities. His debut came out no mercy when he destroyed a jobber by the name of Marty Garner. You may be familiar with him as the guy who took that wicked pedigree back in 96. JBL felt like he was scammed because the $200 Power Ranger was talking the talk, but ended up facing a guy who couldn't fight his way out of a paper bag. So of course, MVP was victorious in his debut. Now back to Taker Kennedy regarding their match. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't that good. You can watch it, but I assume you won't be thinking after a few months or years, damn, I gotta go watch that again. So let's give a quick summary of it. First of all, Kennedy was clearly intimidated. He was wising it up trying to evade Taker's strikes, but it didn't work, and his arm was being worked on. It was clear that a number was done on him, but the rising star had flashes. He countered the old school, exposed the turnbuckle, hell, he even capitalized on little mistakes the Undertaker made. Because of this, he took total control, and even when the opposition began building momentum, he quickly bounced back. Also, that pile driver really caught me off guard. It was very rare to see somebody not named Taker Kane do it, and when you think about it, it showed just how much faith the Undertaker had in Mr. Kennedy in order to allow him to hit the pile driver. I mean, that move was being done by the veteran of the veterans, you know? Like HBK, Undertaker, Kane, those were the only guys that did it. The dead man managed to take back control on the slugfest, which JBL felt was unintelligent of Kennedy to engage in. Because of this, the Undertaker train was rolling, but Mr. Kennedy showed just how good he is evading a choke slam, a last ride, and even slammed the dead man into the steel. On the other side of the spectrum, the Undertaker was kicking out of everything Kennedy was dishing, and so the US champ brought in the title belt, and it ended up being used on him, causing the DQ. Taker stood tall through the tombstone, and it was a cheap finish. The match was just rolling, and it ended in a DQ, which is quite unfortunate. Kennedy was victorious though, and the feud was only just beginning. The next night on a Raw, Kennedy got his ass beat in a failed attempt at getting his heat back. As for SmackDown, he called whatever that was at No Mercy a W, and it didn't matter to him if it was a DQ, it was a win. Add to that, Teddy Long refused to let him go, he decided to put his title on the line against a man Teddy claims he's never beaten. After that, he'll go off to Raw. Regarding that opponent, well, it was Chris Benoit and JBL's like, Welcome to hell. Oh man. The match itself was physical and hard hitting, and just as Kennedy's in control, The Undertaker's music plays, he gets distracted, leading to a hat trick of German suplexes before Benoit transitions into the cross face, forcing Mr. Kennedy to tap, and so there was no contract release. Back to MVP. Since Montel was such a superstar, he came out to SmackDown later that week demanding competition. JBL still cursing him, complaining about how he didn't get pyro in his entrances, let alone a damn sparkle. Speaking of that, WWE must have felt very bad for JBL that they spent their entire budget on one single entrance. Montel called that Marty Garner guy a dangerous individual, made it seem like that W was well fought. Then a Power Ranger chant intensified, which I found quite hilarious. He begged Teddy Long for some competition, you know, somebody that'll actually make him work a sweat, and Teddy Long's like, hold my mic. Just hearing that word competition gave him an idea. First of all, he indicated that after this match, MVP might not have teeth. Suddenly, the pyro goes out and it's Kane. Michael Cole shot it and he's on SmackDown, whatever. This was because he lost the Loser Leaves Raw match earlier that week to Umaga. MVP's like, what did I get myself into? And Marty Garner compared to Kane was just some third league team, whereas Kane was Liverpool or something. Despite this, MVP opted to fight. Ref was looking to call for the bell, but he decides to stretch and delay the match with some stupidity. Kane eventually grew impatient with these actions and decided to bring the fight. He bounced him from the barricade to apron, and Montel had to rake him in the eyes in order to bounce on out of there. Kane's debut on SmackDown, well his return, ended in a no contest, but it didn't matter, why? Because he gets MVP again the following week. Montel called what happened last week scandalous nonsense, why? Because he wasn't ready and that ain't the case now. This time around he actually brought the fight. Sure he got his ass beat, but it was a start. That is until he tried running out there again. Despite this, MVP found a little opening and it didn't really last long because he tried being flashy. Kane was looking to wrap it up, but he gets low blowed to win it by DQ. The way MVP was hyped and how he turned out after these few weeks, Jamarcus Russell-esque. Like, that guy just wasn't fulfilling that potential people saw in him at all. On the other side of things, Mr. Kennedy. He opted to return the favor from the previous week, but flopped harder than Brooke Hogan's music career, as the attack only served to bring out the intensity in The Undertaker. Unfortunately though, the obsession he had for going after the dead man caused him to get involved in MVP's business with Kane. Kennedy for some odd reason demanded The Undertaker in a match, knowing very well that he wasn't there, but what he got instead was a DQ match against his younger brother. MVP was apparently sick and couldn't compete, hence the replacement. As expected, Kane gave him a hard time. MVP had to interfere in order to assist Kennedy, and even then, Kane had the momentum by his side. As he goes for the choke slam, MVP comes in and whacks that leg using a chair, giving the victory to Kennedy. It was a forced W, and this meant he had defeated four former world champions, that being Batista, 
Rey Mysterio, The Undertaker, and now Kane. In light of that controversial victory, Teddy Long booked a tag team match pitting MVP and Mr. Kennedy facing off against the returning Brothers of Destruction. It was the first time in five years that the two men got to team up. As for that match, well, it was a memorable SmackDown moment. Not for the action necessarily, but for the sight of seeing Kane and The Undertaker on the same side of the ring. About the match itself, JBL called MVP a bud-like hand. Kane and Taker had yet to deliver some sustainable damage to the heels, but just when they start building momentum, those guys are like, screw it, opting to lose by count out. All of a sudden, the GM comes out, seeing as he's a disciple of The Undertaker's, that's my conspiracy theory, the match was restarted. This time, though... Kennedy pulls an edge. He left MVP alone with the monsters in the ring and he struggled as a result of this. Things were going so bad for him that Kennedy had to deliver a low blow in order to end this whole thing. But again, the play out Friday nights made this a no DQ, no count out match. Oh, man. JBL proceeded to go on a huge tirade against Teddy Long, calling him an accomplice. And wow, JBL of 06, 07 was truly, and I mean truly, something else. He was crazy. The poor guys in the ring were just toys in this amusement park, but they managed to finally turn things around for a bit, working as a unit. Unfortunately, though, neither working as a unit nor a low blow could stop the brothers, and the fans erupted upon the site of the choke slams. And even that wasn't it, because the Undertaker hit the tombstone pile driver to beat Mr. Kennedy. Awesome moment. I love it because of the fact that the brothers hadn't been seen in nearly five years. They brought fury and intensity and it was entertaining as hell. Even though Mr. Kennedy got his ass handed to him, it still didn't stop him from making yet another challenge. On the November 10th, 2006 episode of SmackDown, Mr. Kennedy came out once again to issue a special kind of challenge to The Undertaker. He gave praise to the dead man for lasting 16 years in the ever-changing landscape of WWE, but had to brag about beating four world champions. Kennedy was so brave that he wanted Taker to answer the challenge in person, and like a bunch before him, he said that 1990 was the beginning of The Undertaker, but 2006 will mark the end. The Phenom wasn't going to decline the challenge. It's obvious as day, or in his case, night. Kennedy had some fear in him, but it wasn't outright. It's like he had to do it. Initially, he failed using the microphone as a weapon, but after multiple attempts, managed to bust the dead man open, leaving him a bloody heat. But then Taker grabbed him by the throw. Kennedy quickly shuts down a counterattack before standing atop a fallen dead man. JBL had loads and loads and loads of praise for Kennedy due to the fact that he came, he saw, he conquered. Simple as that. Shortly afterwards, a first blood match between the two was made for Survivor Series, and meanwhile, MVP was complaining about how Teddy Long abused his power. He said that he's been in street fights easier than whatever that match was, and because of this, Teddy Long booked him in a street fight against, you guessed it, Kane. Down in Manchester, JBL finally started to come around on MVP, and by March of 2007, he was his biggest supporter. As for the fight itself, Kane threw him around for his own enjoyment. He ends up getting pushed into the booth, and oh my god, did that look brutal. A few seconds later, end up tipping the freaking phone booth busting MVP open. He just struggled to find a real opening at this point and even after using a chair it was a dominant performance from the big red monster. After a while he screwed up taking too long leading to a DDT on steel and following the commercial break MVP was officially in control. He rung Kane's bell and it was looking real bad but he set up. It leads to the Kane comeback, you know, side slam, clothesline, all that, and when he decides to bring in some steel steps, Mr. Kennedy came to Montel's assistance. Distraction leads to a low blow, a steel step shot, and because of this, MVP was once again victorious. However, he couldn't celebrate for long because The Undertaker was here. You'd think Kennedy was ready for a fight, right? Well, he instead tossed his buddy to the Sharks. He was all fired up at this point, but opted to walk straight to the back. As a result of that attack from the previous week, Mr. Kennedy suddenly grew a big head, somewhat god complex. He's stating stuff like, sports entertainment last year was like a rudderless ship. Let's talk about this new superstar that shined light on the wasteland, the savior, who I assume was Casey James. And the bright star was comparing his impact to that of Undertakers in the early 90s. Talk about delusion. He brought the evidence from last week, you know, the bloody microphone, before promising to win the first blood match at Survivor Series. To me, this is one of Mr. Kennedy's best damn promos. And the feud itself really brought out the best in him promo-wise. It was all kind of comedy beforehand, but now he was dead serious, and it just led to some very good television. As for MVP, Teddy Long disliked him so much that he booked him in a steel cage match against Kane. The poor guy just couldn't catch a break. Montel wasn't exactly focused on fighting Kane in the beginning, rather escape. He was being battered and beaten from each side of the cage with no end in sight, but unfortunately for the big red monster, he got a little too ahead of himself and attempted to choke slam him off the top rope. This gave MVP a huge opening as he managed to rake him in the eye, kick him off the ropes and climb the hell out of there. Now he was actually starting to prove his worth, like despite the fact that MVP never won these matches clean, he was scoring W's. His relationship with Kennedy was of course still strained, but that didn't stop the loudmouth from thanking him and offering to have a clean slate. It was looking like the relationship was going well, before I go into that, Mr. Kennedy at this point was so damn self-assured of himself being the victor of that first blood match. Add to that, he bragged about his previous victories and in his mind, 
That was where the truth lied. Kennedy was continuously provoking The Undertaker, calling him a coward without saying the exact words themselves. It was a damn, damn good promo. But the gong was heard in the arena, and The Undertaker was coming out. Kennedy stood his ground, he was ready for a fight, and he wasn't backing down, but Taker was two steps ahead of him. He decided to respawn in the middle of the ring, and the heel bolts. As Ken Kennedy's walking to the top of the ramp, The Undertaker's like, Survivor Series, first blood, and suddenly it's raining blood, red goo. I don't know, I don't know what it is, but whatever, red stuff. I just love the confidence radiating from Kennedy. Obviously, he was a coward heel, but the work he was doing around this time was superb. Like, looking at him from the perspective of 2006, he was a surefire world champion in WWE. You'd bet money on it. Before the big match, MVP told Kennedy if he needed any help with The Undertaker, he'll be right there. Kennedy showed his intelligence by rubbing some Vaseline on his forehead, exposed a turnbuckle, preparing for the dead man. In the beginning, the former US champ failed to make any sort of good offense, and by the looks of it, the Vaseline strategy was working. Whenever he tried fighting back, Taker would quickly find a way out. Oddly enough, his tactic was to target the ribs, and JBL explained it as the Undertaker wanting Kennedy to suffer some sort of internal bleeding. And even when he bounced him off the turnbuckle, Kennedy didn't bleed, but he did bleed internally. MVP quickly took notice and brought in a towel, and he made it seem like they're going to the back, but he instead tossed his buddy back into the ring. This time around, Kennedy actually fought back. MVP then comes in with a chair and accidentally blasted The Undertaker, busting him open. Kennedy gets back up, delivers several blows to the dead man before Charles Robinson took notice of the blood, giving him the victory. Things were looking very well for one Mr. Kennedy. He grabbed the mic, tried to stick it to The Undertaker, but there was still some fight in him. JBL suggested he get the hell out of there, but he clearly didn't, and it resulted in a nasty-ass chair shot, which sounded like a damn gunshot. Like, that chair shot in itself is top 5 most brutal from the 2000s in WWE, probably. This concluded with a tombstone pile driver. Oh, man. Match itself was just there. It didn't last as long as the No Mercy Valley, but I like this one over their previous match, so there's that. Later that night, Kane and MVP went at it for all of two seconds during the Survivor Series elimination match. The only action involving the two saw Kane chokeslam Montel leading to the five-star frog splash, which eliminated the highest-paid SmackDown star. Later that week, Teddy Long wanted to make Armageddon something special, so he booked that infernal match between MVP and Kane. Not only that, but a last ride match between Taker and Kennedy. Regarding the two heels, Kennedy was very angry over what went down, questioning that got my back statement from MVP. They argued over who was responsible for that victory at Survivor Series before all of a sudden MVP said, we could have helped each other against the Brothers of Destruction. Basically, MVP thought it was a shame that their relationship has come to this when they could have been helping themselves the entire time. Unfortunately for Montel Montavious Porter, he had such a hard time with a dead man. At one point he tried running, but Kennedy interferes and gets thrown into the ring himself. Kane comes in, they whoop the rest to send them running, and you know what this was leading to. The following week, Mr. Kennedy came out to discuss this last Friday match, and he refused to be distracted by the stipulation. It meant nothing to him because he's already beaten him twice, and the question shouldn't be, is he inside my head? Rather, the contrary. He was doing all this talking, but once he saw the hearse moving, he began pissing him. Himself. Michael Cole stuttering, JBL shouting, cars don't move by themselves. And of course, when the trunk was opened, The Undertaker emerged, signaling what's to come for Mr. Kennedy. Meanwhile, MVP was trying to escape that Inferno match, explaining how every time he wins, Teddy Long makes a matchup with the even more dangerous rules. He refused to compete, but Teddy's like, if you don't, your ass is fired. As for Mr. Kennedy, his match with Kane was looking bleak, but MVP caused the DQ. They jumped him, let's go out, and the big red monster disappeared. So Kennedy knows what's up and decides to run into the crowd. They didn't appear though, but they gave the heels a little warning. Despite all this going on, MVP tried getting his agent to do something about the Inferno match. He didn't want to be stressed with a tag match, you know, Kennedy's coming up to him or whatever, and they were trying to explain their situation, making it seem worse than the other. But in the end, they compromised and got on the same page in order to best the Brothers of Destruction. Regarding the match, same story, just as Kane and Taker try wrapping things up, MVP saves his partner, leading to a brawl on the outside. Kennedy managed to DDT Kane on the ramp and attempted to run him down, but suddenly the lights go out, but when they're back on, Kennedy's like, damn it, it's him, and he hops his ass on out of there. As if that wasn't bad enough, Kane sat up and so the stage was set for both men. They were set to face their worst fears for one final time. Okay, I just want to say I'm biased towards this pay-per-view. I watched it like a million times as a kid, so it ranks as one of my favorites. I even reviewed it about a year and a half ago. It's clearly not as uh, well-refined as my current reviews, but just wanted to mention it. For months, MVP had been avoiding Kane. It didn't matter what match was booked, he'd find a way. Kennedy for months had been bragging about being the Undertaker, but again, it was always with some sort of external help being a title belt or MVP. Okay, first up, the Inferno match. 
poor MVP stood no chance. They even lined up a stretcher for him. As expected, the match itself was limited in what the guys could do. I don't think anybody went into this thinking, oh, it's going to be a classic. Because if anything, previous Inferno matches taught us is that the moment they fight on the outside is when it gets good. Unfortunately, in MVP's case, he was burned. What I find funny in all of this is the fact that WWE literally did worse than this earlier this year, despite the fact that they're PG. JBL's fuming on commentary, placing Teddy Long responsible for this chaos. And in his eyes, the SmackDown GM was a sadistic man who didn't prioritize his talent. This would be addressed in a very, and I mean very underrated promo from SmackDown later that week. Now one down, one to go. Mr. Kennedy and The Undertaker last ride. This one in particular was my favorite of the series, but again, bias. They gave them an awesome promo with the end is near playing, and we all knew how this was ending. Let's talk about the action first. As expected, Mr. Kennedy struggled right in the beginning. The Undertaker was throwing him around, and he couldn't gain any substantial offense. But at that moment, he almost stole the match. That happened again a few minutes later, and it showed that Kennedy was no slouch. It wasn't until he got a hold of a chair that Kennedy became Mr. Offense. He led Taker to the top of the Armageddon structure, and it led to the dead man being thrown off there. The commentary team thought that the match was over. It was done with he tossed him into the hearse but the undertaker sat up and dragged ken to the outside flurry of punches from him repeated chair shots busted open smackdown's rising star and if that wasn't enough the undertaker choke slammed him on top of the hearse before wrapping it up with a tombstone pile driver and that's all she wrote not a bad match in my opinion some feel kennedy didn't benefit from the feud but i see it as a good thing he was elevated to a certain level of feuding with the undertaker they valued him also one thing to mention is that the undertaker defended Kennedy from others in the locker room and even went as far as to choose him as the guy for him to feud with. Kennedy ended up challenging for the world title afterwards and while it would have been cool to see him win the feud, it did anything but hurt him. Regardless of the fact that he lost the feud, Kennedy actually beat The Undertaker twice, so there's that. As for MVP, I thought the feud itself was fun. He gained heat literally and figuratively and it showed just how much they valued him by having Kane work with him. It helped him gain some knowledge and established MVP as a star to watch following Armageddon. In the storyline, he earned JBL's respect after, for one, stealing those victories and two, for getting burnt at Armageddon and coming back after only a few weeks. So yeah, I enjoyed this story. I enjoyed the other one as well. I want to know what you guys think in the comments down below. Well, that's it for this video. Make sure you hit the mic check and the like button and perhaps the playmaker on the subscribe button. Peace. I'm out.